Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Hello, this is uh, Meghna Bhatt from Prevent Connect, and I'm speaking with our two wonderful guests, Holly Curl. She's the author and founder of Stop Street Harassment, and Jessica Raven, who is the executive director for the Collective Action for Safe Spaces. Thank you so much to both of you for being here. Holly, the Collective Action for Safe Spaces had put out the anti-sexual harassment transit campaign in collaboration with the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority in 2012 in D.C., correct? So what has been the response for this anti-sexual harassment transit campaign in collaboration with the the transit system in 2012? We collected stories about street harassment in the Washington, D.C. area, and about a third of the stories were happening on public transit. Wow. So every year, WMATA has to report on what they're doing to the D.C. City Council, and there's a section open to the public. So we recruited people who had been harassed on the subway, and we came and shared our stories during Mm -hmm. that section. And WMATA said, one person's harassment is another person's flirting. It's not a problem on our system. We don't feel like we need to do anything. Fortunately, Muriel Bowser, who is now our mayor of D.C., was chairing the committee, and Mm -hmm. she said, as a woman, I feel differently. You need to do something. And so that was a really big moment. And we got very positive media attention. Within a few weeks, WMATA invited us to their offices and we planned this transit campaign with them. And now we've been part of a campaign for almost five years with them. Wow, that's fascinating. And now the Collective Action for Safe Spaces have also recently released anti-harassment campaign ads in DC Transit, focusing both on bystander intervention and inclusive of communities at a higher risk for being harassed. So Jessica, what has been unique in terms of this campaign, in terms of implications and impact? Why is it important? There are a few things that are unique about the campaign. So we've known for a few years, particularly through Holly's study in 2014, that people who are part of marginalized groups are experiencing harassment more severely. So the new campaign features the faces of Muslim women in hijab and um, trans women of color, which helps us to raise awareness about the problem of sexual harassment and also helps us to address Islamophobia and transphobia and show support to our city's most marginalized communities. So you're not just working to end street harassment and sexual violence, but also addressing xenophobia, transphobia, and in short, other forms of intersectional oppression, right? Um, So Jessica, again, this next question is for you. How do you see street harassment intersecting with other forms of sexual violence and oppression in public spaces? Yeah, in a few different ways. So first, street harassment is backed by the threat that one in five women and between one in 33 and one in 71 men will experience sexual assault in their lifetime. So harassment is like the pre-assault. And it's really important to address harassment before it escalates. And then second, we know that, you know, women of color and especially trans women of color experience some of the highest rates of harassment and violence. And that's because of racism and transphobia. And aggressors are targeting people who are vulnerable in some way. So people experiencing homelessness, people with okay. disabilities and communities of color, especially who are least likely to be believed and supported by the police. And a lot of these identities overlap. So I think you highlight a very important point that needs to be addressed. And you've listened to the community about what their perceptions and experiences are regarding street harassment and sexual violence. So Holly, uh, what are the other um, community-based initiatives have you seen across the globe in terms of prevention and response? At the individual level, we have groups all over the world who are raising awareness okay. as the first step of prevention to say, this is what's happening, this is what it looks like, and it's not okay, and okay. this is how it does connect to other okay. forms of oppression. Okay. And so that's happening through things like marches and flyering and wow. sidewalk chalking and you know holding events and rallies. But we've also been seeing you know more government agencies taking part. So there have been similar campaigns to our transit campaign happening in cities like Boston and Los Angeles here in the U.S., and then internationally in cities like Vancouver, London, Delhi, Bogota. And it's interesting, too, we're also starting to see a rise in governments passing laws around sexual harassment. So there seems to be a lot of movement happening with community organizing and mobilization happening, which is pretty powerful, right? So, Jessica, the question is back to you. Based on your experience working in these campaigns, what are the other ways in which cities and communities and institutions can work towards providing a safer public space? Public art can be really effective for addressing harassment. And I would love 
to do see bystander intervention training in every space. We can identify the places where harassment and assault are happening most frequently mm -hmm. and make sure that the people who are uniquely positioned to respond to it are trained to intervene and de-escalate. Your campaign has received some powerful responses and that's such a great example to other agencies. So it serves as a role model to other agencies of listening to their, you know, what their communities need. I also believe that what is more remarkable is also the power of partnerships and collaborations that's making this happen, making these public spaces more safer and free of harassment and violence. Um, Holly, what would be your recommendations for other preventionists and activists for preventing street harassment to end this you know, cycle of sexual violence and other forms of oppression? Yeah, I'd say that to anyone who is working on the issue of sexual violence, to be sure to incorporate mm -hmm. street harassment as part of their work, okay. because it is part of the continuum and related. And the individuals they are working with most likely have experienced street harassment, okay. or they've witnessed it, which can also make them feel unsafe. So just acknowledging that they may be going through this and its connection to sexual violence is important. Okay. Um, for individuals who are already working on this issue, I would just echo what you said about partnerships and how important they are because you can get a lot more done often yes. if you have other people on board with you and you can bring in new perspectives. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah. I guess keeping in mind the Anti-Street Harassment Awareness Week, how do you reflect on the accomplishments and the challenges faced in the past few years in terms of preventing and responding to street harassment and sexual violence? Yes, we have seen such an increase in activism and awareness and efforts on this issue in the last few years. And I think it's in large part due to social media and online methods that allow us to more easily connect with each other, to okay. share our stories, and to keep this issue in the news over and over. And for me personally, I think the biggest benefit has been being able to connect with groups all over the world, learn from each other, and mobilize in a larger way. And so this is a global problem but there's a global response to it. And because of social media and the internet and just ways of connecting, we can be stronger together. So thank you so much to both of you for sharing your insights and investing your time with us at Prevent Connect and sharing your feedback and your experiences. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much for having us. Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission, or to show your support, visit calcasa.org. That's C-A-L-C-A-S-A dot O-R-G.